welcome to Brew Build, your place for DIY home improvements. I'm Paul. Today, I get to start the process of building our new pergola, which means I have to remove this old patio cover. Are you ready? Let's go cut things up. The wood beams will be delivered soon for our new pergola. So I need to get this old patio cover out of the way. When I take this apart, I'll have to take it apart from the top down. Now, I'm a little leery about getting on top of this thing with the three posts not being here, but I think it will support me. So let's get up on the roof and tear this down. Tools and items needed. Six by eight, six by six, and two by six rough cut lumber. Simpson decorative hardware, six inch power lag screws, a tape measure, a string, torpedo, and four foot level, a screw gun drill driver, a circular saw, a sawzall, a multi-tool, a handsaw, a hand wood rasp file, a hammer, a wonder bar, a square, wood stain sealer, gloves, and your personal safety gear. So I'll remove this plastic roofing material first. And once that's gone, I'll unscrew these two by twos. And then once those are out of the way, then I'll remove the two four by six beams that are unsupported. And then I could take the two by eight piece off, the cross beam off. And then once that's gone, it just leaves the three supported beams that I'll get out of the way. And then this should be done. On the Bruce scale, technical ability I rate as an expert. You need to be able to make correct measurements as well as know how to cut and notch wood. Physical ability, I rate between difficult and hard. There is a lot of picking up and moving large wooden beams. At some point, you will probably need some help. My plan was to reuse the same existing ledger here, just moving it over about six to eight inches. Well, after unbolting it, I discovered all these holes in the stucco. I guess somebody's playing, well, let's try to find the stud by drilling holes in the stucco, which is never good, especially when there seems to be this big air gap. So it kind of concerned me, would I be able to get the ledger board reattached to the studs? So I ended up calling the building inspector to see if there's some other options of how to hang the beams for the pergola. He said he'd stop by. Well, after he was here and what we came up with was I'll break into the stucco and then I'll get some hangers and attach the hangers to the studs and header. And then the beams will be attached to the hangers, which is actually kind of good because my wife likes the look of a beam coming directly out of stucco and not having to have the extra ledger board attached. Once I get the stucco broken off, then I'll be able to see what's in here and what I can attach the hangers to. So let's go break some stucco. I need to mark then remove about a 16 inch square section of stucco for each hanger. I won't go into all the details in this video since there are so many types of siding out there. But if you are interested in how I removed and patched the stucco, let me know and I'll make another video covering this topic.
I finished opening the wall up for the hangers. I can finally see how this wall was built and why it was so challenging for ever attached to the ledger board. There is a 4x header in the back with a 2x6 attached to the bottom. So for the two center beams, my plan is to attach a 2x10 to the header and top plate and then screw the hangers into that 2x10. Before I start cutting the wood pieces for these hangers, I'll mark exactly where they need to go. The center line for the pergola would be based off these two large sliding glass doors at the back of the house. Using a level and tape measure, I'll mark the center line between the glass doors first, then I'll measure everything off this line. I've attached and positioned the two outside column post bases, measuring between the inside edge of one to the outside edge of the other gives me the center line distance of 21 feet. So the two outside hangers need to have a center line 10 and a half feet or 126 inches from the main center point. Using a tape measure, I'll put 126 on the main center line, then add a mark at zero for the first and fourth hanger. Since there are four beams, we divide the 21 feet by three for the three spaces between the beams, which gives us seven feet or 84 inches. So the two inside beams will have a center line 84 inches from the two outside beams, or 42 inches from the main center point. This concludes today's math lesson. I finished the four locations that will have the hangers. So I got some wood in here that the hanger will be attaching to, and then the beam will of course go into the hanger. And the two middle ones, I just ended up using a two by 10 basically, and screwing it into the header that's back there as well as the top plate. I tried using nails and of course the first nail that I hit, I ended up bending it. So I switched to construction screws instead to hold it in. On the two end ones, I did a two by 10 as well as a two by six vertically attached to the stud. So before I put these hangers on, I'll need to put the flashing back and then I have some of the uh, kind of window flashing that I'll put around that it has, it's kind of rubbery. So any screws that go through this should seal around the rubber. So let me get working on the flashing here and get these hangers attached. I added some painter's tape and remarked the center lines for the beams since the first marks would be covered up with flashing. When waterproofing a wall, remember upper layers overlap lower layers. I'm applying two strips of window flashing membrane first against the wood. They go from the top edge under the windowsill to about one inch above the sliding door below, overlapping the existing window flashing. That way, any water that it drains down the flashing will stay away from the wood structure. Then I'll fold back the existing flashing and staple it in place, removing all loose pieces of stucco and debris. Then I'll add two or three more pieces of flashing paper, tucking them in between the old flashing paper and the stucco. Just remember to start with the lower ones first, overlapping a couple of inches as you move up the wall. When attaching the hanger, I cut a 2x4 the width of the 6x8 beams and clamped it inside the hanger while I was attaching it to the wall. The hanger did have a bit of flex in it, and doing this assured that the beam would fit properly after it was screwed into the wall. I would hold the hanger in place at the proper height, check the level, then drill two pilot holes, one on each side. Then put in two screws, but not tighten them. Check the level again. Once it was perfectly level, then tighten the screws and remove the 2x4. After that, put in the remaining 12 screws. To attach the post to the concrete, we're using a Simpson Strong Tie wood to concrete base. Three of these went in with ease. I just had to grind down the 5 8 inch anchor bolt so the one inch standoff plate would fit. But one of the anchor bolts I stuck into the concrete was way off and I had to drill a hole and put in a new anchor bolt. It was a comedy of errors. Painful at the time, but I was able to get it done. I'll probably make another video on that project and call it 
how not to put in an anchor bolt, and what to do if it gets stuck. So be sure to subscribe so you don't miss Hit it. Hit that like button and subscribe to Brew Build. Hit that like button and subscribe to Brew Build. To build the pergola, it will have 6x6 posts with 16 foot 6x8 beams attaching to the house and going 36 inches past the post, connected using Simpson strong tie hardware. Then there will be 2x6s spanning the 24 feet across the beams. We ordered four 6x8x16 by by foot beams, four 6x6x16 by by foot beams, which I'll use for the four posts and a 24 foot cross beam, then eight 2x6x16 by by and eight 2x6x8, by by which will also be used for the cross pieces. All are rough cut Douglas fir and came from a local lumber yard. They dropped it off, literally dropped it off. Then we had to move the wood into the backyard. Before installing the beams and posts, we wanted to start the staining and sealing process. So we chose this product here, which is a waterproofing stain and sealer and had it mixed into a custom color for us. The first thing we did is we took a file to smooth out the edges and remove any splintered wood. Then we took a stiff brush to remove any dust and to smooth out the surface a bit more. Our house has some rough cut wood in it and we really wanted to match that look, but some of these edges were just way too rough. Then we picked which surface we wanted to be on top, choosing the more interesting grain to be on the bottom because that's what you're going to see. After marking it, we flipped it over and started to stain and seal the bottom because we wanted gravity to help penetrate the stain further into the wood. Then we flipped them on their sides and did some of the deeper cracks. And to help with penetration even further, we did thin the product a little bit with water. Using sawhorses made the staining of these beams much easier and quicker for my wife than having to deal with going up and down a ladder. Once they're in place, we'll do the top side and any other areas that still need to be stained. So I need to cut two posts and get those attached, and then I'm going to try to pick up one of these beams by myself. Using the post height off my 3D model, which is 84 inches, and subtracting the one inch for the post anchor standoff, I will cut the two middle posts at a height of 83 inches. My skill saw has a standard seven inch blade, so I will need to mark each side of the six by six, and then cut one side, flip it over, and cut the other side. Then use a sawzall to finish off the cut. Hopefully, I can keep everything lined up. I got a little bit off of the sawzall, so this should be fine after smoothing out with this hand plane. My son came over to help me get these beams up. I cut the post first and then attached it to the post base. Using a level and making sure that the post was plumb, I put in two of the screws to attach the post to the post anchor. Then we lifted up one of these beams and put it on top of the scaffolding that I'm sitting on and then moved the scaffolding into place. Then I picked up one end and placed it inside the hanger and then he picked the other end and put it on top of the post. Then I put in one screw into the hanger and then attach one Simpson T to help keep the beam in place. Eventually, there'll be a T on each side of the post. The brackets that we're using for our pergola are made by Simpson and they're part of their Outdoor Accent hardware product line. Now, both collections do use special screws and washers and when you use them, they give the bracket a beefier, more finished look.
Hey, so my son came over last night and we got the post and beams installed. This one came out a little tall and it didn't really line up here in the front. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this bracket off and lift this post up and set on top of a ladder and that'll give me the ability to file down the top of this post some and get rid of this large gap. So let me hop down and lift this sucker up. I used my multi-tool with a grinder attachment to flatten out any high spots and remove some material off the top back side of the post. Then use the carpenter square to check that it is square and flat. Time to lower this beam back down and reattach the T-bracket. Some of the 2x6s are splitting rather badly. I'm gluing and clamping some of the bad ones before I notch them. I'm not sure if the drop from the truck caused this or they just sent me some bad pieces. Somewhat disappointing either way. This 6x6 has the worst split and is causing the board to warp. So if you use a screwdriver, you can help to open up the crack and get the glue to penetrate further into the wood. Make sure to wipe any excess glue before it dries, especially if you're going to be using stain. Now do this after you clamp your wood and use a couple of wet paper towels. I need to get these posts vertical and these beams square to the house. So I'll be using this tie down, a tape measure, and a level. Once I'm happy with the position, then I'll start working on the cross pieces that go on top. The distance post to post should be 84 inches, which is the beam to beam spacing on the wall. To get the first post plumb, I'll use a four foot level and clamp two by four braces to hold the post in place. Then check that the distance is 84 inches between each post edge and check that each post is plumb and vertical, making any adjustments as needed. Two by four braces and tie down straps are used to hold everything in place when I'm done. The design of the pergola has two by six cross beams spanning 24 feet. I'll achieve this by staggering 16 foot and 8 foot pieces every 2 feet, starting with the first cross beam 1 foot from the house. At the end above the post will be two 6 by 6s spanning the 24 foot distance. So we wanted these large 6 by 8 beams to be as high as possible, but we didn't want the cross piece going above the windowsill. So I'm going to notch both the beam and the cross piece so they fit into each other. Removing about 3 and a half inches. This will also allow us enough space in case we decide to add a roof on later. So I think it'll also be good for these 2x6s to sit inside these big notches and that should keep them from warping. And I think it'll look a lot more interesting having this sitting within this beam than doing your typical way of just having it sitting on top with this little metal bracket holding it. So I'm going to start with these cheaper 2x6s and once I'm done with those and comfortable I'll move on to this 6x6 here and then we'll notch this six by eight and start fitting these pieces together. I'll cut a two inch notch at the end of row five first. I'm starting with row five so the other end will clear the kitchen roof. This is two inches deep and half the width of the six by eight beam, basically three inches. Lining up the notch for the third beam, I've placed this 2x6 on top of the beams in its position. Then I used a pen and marked the cut lines on the 2x6 on each side of the other two beams. Time to go notch this. To cut the notches in the middle of a 2x6, I set my blade at a depth of 2 inches. Cutting the two outside marks first, then made a bunch of cuts every quarter inch. Now for the fun part. Use a hammer to break off thin pieces of wood. A 
A multi-tool works great for removing what is left. Bevel the corners a bit, using a file attachment to help prevent splitting. All right, there's one. I would like another notch, please. There was a whole lot of marking, cutting, smacking, trimming, filing to get this all done. I was able to notch out a few boards together so that did save some time. Then I had to cut some ends to fit within the roof line and the fascia board. Once they were cut and all fit into place, it was time to mark and notch the beams. The beams will have a one and a half inch deep notch in them, so I need to adjust the skill saw. And once it's at that one and a half inch depth, lock it in place. I'll use the same process, marking the beam on each side of the 2x6. Cut the two outside marks first, then do multiple cuts a quarter inch apart. The reason I do the two outside cuts first is to take the time to make those straight and accurate. It's very easy to get sloppy and forget when you start making fast cuts. Using this one inch chisel helps cleanly break off all the thin strips of wood. I'll notch this beam first for all the 2x6 cross pieces. If everything fits, then I'll mark and cut all the other notches in the beams. All the 2x6 cross pieces are finished. Yeehaw! Yeehaw! Time to move on to the two 6x6s and start notching those. To help protect the wood and the paint from the saw, I'll be putting some painter's tape right on the line. Double check that the blade depth is set at two inches again and start cutting.
Let's see how this fits. I didn't cut off enough. I also need it to fit over the T brackets, so I'll take the circular saw and cut off a blade width on each side. Okay, the longer 6x6 is notched, so I need to measure the size of the notch for the second 6x6 that will butt up to the first 6x6. Looks like three and a quarter inches. This notch will need to be two inches deep and three and a quarter inches wide. I like to mark the line on the inside of three and a quarter, so when I cut on the line, the outside of my saw blade will be at the correct distance. And up we go. Hmm, it's a big size difference between these two beams. I wish I had noticed that earlier. Let's get the last notch cut in the 6x6 cross piece. I want to start staining the 2x6s, so I need to check the fit of all the notches. They can't be too snug or else I won't be able to get them back in after they are stained. Since the tops will be stained over, I'm adding numbers to the inside of the notches as well. I've removed the fascia board on this side of the house to help me get the proper angle and measurements for cutting the ends of the 2x6s. To mark the cut lines for the 2x6s, I use a 2x4 as a guide, running it along the rafters of the house. Mark the 2x6 while moving the 2x4 down the end of the rafters. Once cut, these should fit perfectly up against the fascia board. I need to make some straight cuts on the other 2x6s. I don't want a smooth cut on the ends that are exposed. Using my sawzall, I make the ends look more like a rough cut. Now that all the 6x6s are notched, trimmed, and prepped, I'll start the staining process. While those are drying, I'll get back to cutting the notches and the beams for the two 6x6 cross pieces. Back to my mismatched beams. I need the tops of these beams to be flush with each other, so I'll be cutting this notch differently, making it custom for each beam. Hopefully when it's done, you won't notice. Alert! Alert! We have an apricot. Please leave the area immediately. Alert! Do not knock down apricot. Alert! Apricot, alert! I have the 6x6 cross pieces directly above the post. I'm just checking that everything is aligned. They look straight, so I'll go mark the 6x8 cut lines for the notches. This is the notch that is custom for each side, so I'm making myself a note to change the blade depth. And the notch needs to be wider for this one 6x6. If I do this correctly, you shouldn't be able to notice the difference in sizes. Make sure the depth is an inch and a half, then double check it against a notch that has already been cut. Looks good. Just making sure it's not going to cut into the T-bracket.
That was cool. Jess, three more to cut. I need to reset the saw blade for the special notch. I'll make cuts with a blade depth of an inch and a quarter, then go back to the inch and a half and run the saw just halfway through the beam. This one is tight, so I'm going to cut off a blade width using a piece of quarter inch plywood as a guide. Using a guide keeps the saw cutting straight, so I can just concentrate on keeping the saw level. This is especially helpful when one side of the saw is unsupported. Time to get this all put together! After getting the two 6x6s on top of the beams, I look down at it from the other end, and it appears that this end goes up slightly higher. So I grab my string level to check the post heights, and this post is about a half inch too tall. So I'm going to lift the beam up, remove the post, then trim it down. I'll mark where I need to cut it first, then raise the beam up. Since I'm doing this by myself, I grab my two ton car jack. I only need to raise the beam up a couple of inches to set it on top of the ladder. Then I can safely unscrew the bolts and remove the post. Before I trim this, I want to do a quick check to make sure that the blade is square to the saw base. Time to go old school. Using this handsaw should give me a cleaner cut than the sawzall. Too bad I didn't think of it earlier. This is definitely my best cut. Who needs power tools? I'll quickly stain and seal the top of the post before lowering the beam down. Let's get this back together and start putting up the 2x6s. I have all the beam and rafters notched and fitting together, so now it's time to get the strong tie T's in place to connect the beams to the post. Once I have the T in place, I'll clamp it, and then I'll drill some pilot holes using this large nut washer as a guide. The hardware comes with special self-drilling screws, so you shouldn't have to pre-drill. However, some are close to the ends of the beams, and I did hear the wood split when I put one in one of the hangers. I'm just being extra cautious. Once I'm done with the tees, then I'll go around and install the remaining screws and decorative nut washers in the post bases and hangers. I did notch the 6x6 big enough so that the T bracket would fit under it. That way the tees can be centered within the 6x8 beam. Once I have the bracket level, then I'll clamp it to hold it in place. I'm only drilling in about 3 eighths of an inch, just enough to help the screw get properly started in the rough cut wood. Each screw has a shear load rating of 470 pounds, so a six of these on each side, I don't think this is going anywhere.
For the hangers, I also pre-drilled using an 8 inch drill bit. When pre-drilling wood to prevent splitting, the bit should be slightly smaller than the diameter of the screw shaft. Alright, the next step is to attach the rafters to the beam here. So I'll be using these construction structural screws. And I'll be actually countersinking a little bit in the top of the rafter. And then using another bit to drill that a little bit more to keep the wood from splitting. Then using the impact driver to drive these in through the rafter into the beam. So let me get this going. Well, that should do it for the pergola. It looks great and it's nice and strong. I need to finish some electrical work, then I could get the building inspector out here to sign off on everything. Now be sure to subscribe to Build. I need to build a small retaining wall, I need to build a fireplace and barbecue area, and I need to finish installing the patio pavers around the side of the house. And I'm sure there'll be some other projects added on as well. Now, let's see if I can still do a dip. Alright, I guess no excuse to not work out. <laughs>